record button as we are starting. And then I'm going to mention this again at the end, but we will have an opportunity for you to share feedback and evaluation as well as to let us know what webinars you want to hear about in the future. Thank you, Bethany, for typing in the information on Carrot. All right, so a little bit of background on the AEBG TAP, the Technical Assistance Project. This is a project that was recently funded by the Adult Education Block Grant Office out of the Chancellor and Department of Education. And the Sacramento County Office of Education is the, the lead contractor on this project. And they're working with several partners, one of which is the American Institute for Research. And we are also working with CASAS and OTAN on this. This webinar is one that's put on by the American Institute for Research. And just a little bit of background about us. We are an international organization whose mission is really to conduct and apply the best quality behavioral and social science research and evaluation possible that can work and focus toward improving the lives of people and really focusing on improving the lives of the disadvantaged. And so all of our work is in alignment with this mission and this goal as the AEBG TAP pro program and project seeks to provide support across the state of California for programs that receive the adult ed block grant funding to serve this population. You'll see that this work is in alignment with our mission. So what we are doing specifically at AIR in terms of the AEBG TAP project is we are providing technical assistance and professional development. We are able to provide technical assistance on request and encourage you to reach out and contact and use the adult education block grant webpage to submit requests if you need support and technical assistance. And then we are really trying to build the capacity of consortiums by offering effective instruction in all of the seven program areas, making sure that we help you support work that aligns what you're offering and the services that you have for your students in a seamless manner so that they can successfully transition to college and career, and that we are providing support along the way for your adult learners related to their college and career preparation or aspirations. And then finally, we are seeking to help consortiums continue to build and develop exemplary leaders, build leadership capacity within consortiums. So this is the third webinar that we have offered in support of that goal and in support of that mission. And we've offered one on collaborative professional development as well as on accelerated learning. And this one is focused on leveraging resources. And so what you'll see here is our plan for the session. We have about 90 minutes or so for the webinar today. And we hope to give you an overview and some background on leveraging resources sharing a little bit of the differences between blending and braiding, and helping you think about ways in which you want to consider implementing opportunities to leverage resources. And then we're going to share some resources and tools that will help you do that. Following that, we're going to hear from two experts in the field who have demonstrated their strength and abilities to really leverage resources well. And so you'll hear a program perspective from the School of Continuing Education at North Orange County Community College District. And then you'll hear from an adult school, Huntington Beach Adult School. And they'll both be sharing experiences that they've had, the good and the bad, with leveraging resources, as well as showing examples so that you can get ideas of things that you might be able to replicate or, or offer at your program and within your consortium. Then we'll have the opportunity to have some closing questions and talk about what's next and get your thoughts on things that we might do next in terms of future webinars too.
So with that, I want to introduce our wonderful presenters today. We have three, as you heard from earlier. Um, we are going to start with hearing from Alexander Dane, who's from the Sparks Policy Institute. Alex is a senior consultant with Spark Policy Institute, and for over a decade, he's been working on community development, program design, strategic planning, and project management. And he is joining us from Denver, Colorado. And you'll see from his presentation that a lot of his work and research is in the area of collective impact and the framework related to collective impact that really seeks to build on the partnerships and the variety of stakeholders who we need to collaborate with for success and initiatives. And he's also worked at the federal level and done a lot around partnerships at the international level as well. So we're excited to have Alex join us and share our overview on leveraging resources. We also have with us today Steve Curiel, who is the principal at Huntington Beach Adult School. He has been involved and worked in adult education for over 16 years in administration. And during that time, he's been able to manage and lead all of the variety of program areas offered in adult education. He's been the principal at Huntington Beach Adult School for seven years, and, and they serve about 7,000 students. But many of you may also know him through his leadership roles in the state. He is presently the president of the California Com Council for Adult Education, and also sits on the board as the Orange County representative for the AXA Adult Education Council. So we are going to hear from Steve shortly. And then, of course, Ms. Valentina Portel, who is the provost for the School of Continuing Education at North Orange County Community College District. She's been there since 2002. And prior to serving as provost, she was the dean of instructional and support and student services. Valentina has also served on a number of state level boards. She's been serving on the board for the Association of Community and Continuing Education, ACE, since 2011. And she's also served on the California Community College Chancellor's Office Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative, as well as on the California Department of Education field partnership team. So as you see, we have wonderful presenters with a varied background to share with you their experiences on leveraging resources. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Alex Dane, who's going to get us started with the overview. So Alex, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is an excellent opportunity to share a little bit about some of these frameworks for leveraging funding and or where you are uh, in terms of adult education, sort of the needs that you have, and how blending and braiding and leveraging funding um, are all. Uh, so before we jump into concepts of funding and braiding. I wanted to do a poll, so let's do that up and see what the familiarity of, of the group is on the current level knowledge about blending and braiding resources and what that is. From having a basic understanding to being familiar with specific blending and braided models involved on the finance side, financial side, and fiscal side of blended and braiding to being an expert on blending and braiding resources. We'll give you guys a couple minutes to, to ring on, on that. We have a trend towards some folks having a, a basic understanding of what, what the concept is. 
and it does go by different names as well. So there's no one right answer. Blending and braiding resources is a framework and a tool is just that. It's a tool in uh, the, the overall toolbox of leveraging resources and what that looks like. It looks like we do have some experts. Uh, we have an expert on blending and braiding and someone who's involved in the uh, financial side of it. So those are the folks on the line to keep me honest as we move forward today uh, and discuss these different concepts here. So let's jump to the first of the slides and I'll So the terms blending and braiding are frequently used often together and generally uh, with little definition. Refer to two different approaches uh, to fiscal coordination, essentially. Blending funding involves commingling funds into one pot uh, where administrators and financial managers can draw out for uh, service dollars for different needs and different expenses. So in this case, uh, now, needs could be met from different funding streams. And in contrast, braided funding usually involves multiple funding streams um, used to pay for all of the service and expenditures by or a different program. Uh, careful accounting to how every dollar from each funding stream is spent. And rest in going through these concepts uh, we may draw out and see whether braiding is more applicable and on the ground actual uh, to where you are, or do you have experience within um, blending? Uh, what is blending? Let's start with that one. Uh, blending involves commingling of funds into one pot, uh, again, where you can draw out uh, risk dollars, uh, operational dollars. Those can be met from that one pot itself. Checking account, so you may receive uh, funds from a different variety of different sources, check, get money owed, but once it goes into your checking account, it becomes a pool of money that you can draw upon for expenses like rent or mortgage or utility. Uh, you don't have to account what funding paid for. The current approach um, for on funding accountability focuses compliance, often without a complementary emphasis on performance or outcomes. So blended funding is politically challenging, so some funding streams cannot be blended. Other funding streams will require uh, funders to allow an exception on how uh, reporting normally functions. Instead of a usual reporting, funders can opt to accept their reports on services and outcomes across the population being served rather uh, than an exactly which uh, adult learning services um, were provided with. So to lend funding, you'll need to work closely with funders to ensure that you can meet uh, their reporting re requirements. Uh, and although that's challenging uh, to do, once funders um, are on board, blending funding is a less challenging to implement uh, rather than braided funding. There's significantly less workload. Tracking and accountability happens across uh, uh, the different funding streams. So rather than reporting to funders on the funding stream alone, reporting is done on how the collective fund. Uh, blending can allow you to pay for services that may not be allowable with more categorical funding approaches. However, many funders and the flexibility associated with blending makes it seem too risky as it often looks like uh, supplanting, um, they end up with less detailed information on how their specific dollars have been spent. And for this reason, many funders are only willing to contribute small amounts, uh, if any, to a blended model. Take a look at a blended uh, funding example. So in this case, imagine an adult learning program uh, that cost thousand dollars per learner served. If a hundred learners are served, it needs a budget of a hundred thousand dollars to be successful. And this chart shows how blended funding can allow for more students to be served uh, than an individual funder could have served. Um, 
each of the funding streams have different eligibility, but all adult learner eligible for multiple programs. So funding stream A is paying for 25 students, but 30 are eligible for the funding stream and will receive service. Funding stream B is paying for 25 students, but 50 are eligible for that funding stream will receive service. Funding stream C is paying for 50, but overall 100 are eligible for that funding stream will receive service. There's no way to report on which funding stream uh, paid for which expense, uh, which can be politically challenging, as we mentioned, uh, using agency funds. Not all funding streams can be. But if your funders are on board, if it's a different type of funding, uh, blended funding is less challenging to implement than and less workload and tracking across the different. As far as fiscal blending and funding goes, uh, document some on this. Important to do. Document. Alex, excuse me one moment. Alex, can you yeah. hear me? Um, if you can speak a little bit louder, and I, we don't know if it's maybe moving that's happening, but your sound quality is cutting in and out, and so some of the participants are having a hard time following the presentation because they can't hear everything that you're saying. It's cutting in and out. So one suggestion was talking a little bit louder. And I don't know, again, if the, if you're moving on the mic or what that might be that's causing it to cut in and out. But that's one of the things we're trying to work out. Gotcha. Thanks. Thank you. We'll try and work on that and see if, let me know if the issue persists. Uh, some tips on blended uh, blending. Document the cost of providing services. Prepare for a blended funding model. You must be able to demonstrate the cost of providing services. In essence, you're creating a case rate for providing a set of services offering in your program. That case rate lets your funders know what to expect uh, from the funding. Um, by using the, the previous example for the funding stream A, B, and C are blended in one pot of all the learners that are eligible, funding stream A, but funding stream A is only picking up 50 cost of those to the student. Because of that blended model, the funder can see their funding supporting and able to support twice as many uh, money. The next tip in blending Track the eligibility of and this will be key across blending and across grade. Uh, tracking the eligibility of you have multiple funding sources during all of students, adult learners in your program, it's critical to assess the eligibility of every student served for every funding. Part of how you'll be able to report the leveraging of funds to funders will also prepare you to return to the funder to ask for more funding uh, if the population, larger portion, being served and with the funding provided. You convey to your funder essentially what the bang for the buck. The next step, measure. Measuring the outcome of your services in a traditional model, a funder knows exactly where your money went, good about the, the detailed services provided to a defined set of clients. In a blended model, the funder loses kind of that widget counting level of detail. But by evaluating outcomes of your program, you're replacing those widgets with detailed data, as well as providing data that helps the funder to, uh, to understand what their funding accomplished, not just what they're look at braiding. So in contrast, braided funding involves multiple funding streams used to pay for all of the services needed by a given person. Careful accounting of how every dollar from each funding stream is spent. Uh, the term braiding is used because multiple funding streams are initially separate 
and they're brought together for more than one funding stream can support those services and then pulled back apart to report to funders on how that money was spent. So the trend out there and moving towards a, a rated uh, fund, the need for funding um, across finding different sources and what that looks like from agents looking at federal, state, local, as well as philanthropic and community-driven organizations as well. So the braiding often presents the most feasible pathway for fund the set of services provided and educational outcomes across job training, ESL, citizenship, parent education. So when multiple Alex, yeah. I'm going. I'm sorry. I'm having to interrupt one more time, but it sounds. It doesn't seem as if the cutting in and out has improved any. Are you possibly able to dial in through the computer audio or switch to the computer audio or either dial in from a landline because it's continuing to cut in and out? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, hear you. It sounds at a distance, but we couldn't hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll try to project. Let me know if that's adequate. Okay. Great. Uh, so where we were, we were talking about braiding and when it is needed and what that looks like. So again, braiding is uh, pulling together different funding streams uh, that are paying uh, for a single program or system. Um, and the, the system will be uh, carefully designed to allow for sufficient reporting to ensure each funding stream is only paying for activities that are eligible under that funding stream. So braiding, braiding funding requires significant effort to create the system uh, for tracking how the funding is used. Uh, the design of braided funding systems it's beneficial that it can respond to the individually individualized needs of how many types of students and adult learners will require uh, different services and then uh, who would be paying for those services through different funding streams. So ideally the decision happens uh, after the needs of individual or family being served and adult learners being served uh, are identified so that funding does not drive the services being provided. Uh, this type of braided funding requires a clear understanding of the eligible populations and students and the eligible services as well, so decisions on how to fund those services can be made uh, after the fact rather than, to, rather than prior to learning the service needs of the learners. So what does this look like? Here's a, a braiding example. Imagine an adult learner walks into a school um, or a program. There's an eligibility check at the front door to make sure, A, they can participate in the program. Uh, so there's some level of information gathering at that point. From there, the adult learner is presented with those services that they're eligible for in, in a seamless manner just going through the front door of what that organization is. The client does not, or the, the adult learner does not see anything other than the services that are presented. Because of the braided model, services can be aligned with the, exactly what the adult learner needs. Um, some of those services um, would be uh, provided through different programs within the, the school itself. But on the back end, um, this is what where the lift needs to happen as far as pulling together a braided example of a braided funding model. Um, so this is the behind the scenes. So on the administration side, the front door entity uh, needs to make sure that the adult learner can participate in the program and documents and files uh, both the eligibility and any restrictions on the allowability 
um, as a result of that eligibility for different funding streams and different programs. So this is sometimes a structural change in an organization. Uh, instead of assigning people to so programs and to silos, they're assigning them to the overall services um, that the client has helped to identify that they need, um, whether those programs are within one bucket of ESL, citizenship, GED, parent education. They're able to pick across of those and pull in different services um, that are pulling in from different funding um, sources. So this is a real change. Uh, Sometimes in implementing this grading approach as, as far as implementation goes, uh, it can be a change for the staff. The fiscal staff will have to sometimes go with the flow in, in terms of budgeting and spend down occurs. So uh, predefined budgets are a good starting place for understanding this, but spend down is going to vary from month to month based on client eligibility and allowability and the decisions that are being made behind the scenes. So it's important to remember, as far as tips go with grading funding, what this looks like, uh, that the, the funding streams are going to retain their original requirements and expectations, uh, including all the tracking and reporting. So you'll have to manage your funds as if they're independent, even though you're using them collectively to support a, a coordinated package of services for an adult learner. Uh, graded funding model is primarily necessary due to uh, limits on eligibility across different learners and across those different funding streams. Uh, so it may be necessary due to the limits on the types of services and programs you can provide under different funding streams uh, that will have to address those issues. Uh, before spending any of your funding, it's going to be important to develop a coordinated financing plan that distributes funding across uh, that distributes funding appropriately um, by funding stream. So a braided model can also be necessary when you have funding streams equally eligible to pay for the services you're providing to all the adult learners that you're serving. So federal requirements for cost allocation can make it really difficult, if not impossible at that point, to create a blended funding model. Uh, to understand audit requirements, take the time to meet with auditors prior to spending any of this funding. Often, um, administrators are the only point of contact between uh, the, the grantee, the entity, the, the educational entity, and the funder itself. So understanding the audit requirements of the funder is very important. Also, the braided funding model needs to uh, carefully uh, define decision-making authority. Uh, and systems, you'll need to carefully define what populations are eligible for which services through which your model will ensure the front door, that entity of the program, knows the eligibility. Uh, so when a learner enters that front door, the staff at that institution assigned uh, within that system needs to be vested with the authority to de determine uh, which services and which uh, programs that that learner can participate in. Uh, there's also that second stage of decision making that's associated with uh, assigning which funding streams go to which services. So it may be that some services are limited by the populations that you're serving. So your programmatic staff and your administration will be responsible for working with learners uh, to develop and understand uh, where there are limitations on specific services that they're looking for but may not be able to receive. Uh, and again, the last stage of decision making in the braided model is the financial component and that is happening at the back door, not the front door of the organization. So after services are provided uh, and programs are uh, delivered as far as the learning curriculum goes, the finance staff will be assigned, will be responsible for assigning which funding streams uh, will cover that cost and what that looks like. As far as implementing uh, a blending and braiding uh, model and what that looks like, it, it's important uh, and it's easy to fall into the trap of designing programs to match funding. And this phase is intended to avoid that pitfall, essentially sitting down and 
visioning what services and what the ultimate outcomes of your educational programs are intending to achieve. So letting the vision drive the process. So by letting the vision drive the process, this state, this is um, really want to focus on where your program and where the school is headed and what you're trying to accomplish on behalf of the learners in, in the system. So before starting to define policy or the system uh, and the, the funding model, uh, it's important to let that vision process be the way. As far as the next phase and understanding, there needs to be a solid understanding of what the different programs and services that are being offered by the institution are and what that looks like and crosswalking it and analyzing it with the funding streams uh, that match up of where there's that uh, eligibility and allowability um, for those different funding streams. So meeting with fiscal staff to collect and discuss uh, documentation from current funders regarding allowable expenses, the documentation of expenses and reporting requirements and understanding uh, the rules and regulations of, of different agencies as well as different uh, local funders, bond funders, looking at other revenue sources including uh, community-based organizations and philanthropy. This is all stitched together. Uh, when you're looking at and identifying alternative funding streams for, for a braiding model or, or for blending, it's it's important to ask yourself institutionally what are the internal funding streams that are already available to your institution? What are the funding streams that already support this population more broadly community-wide including federal, state, and local? And then what non-public funding streams could serve as a match? Looking at those private sector foundation funding streams, local foundations, corporate giving programs in the community, uh, and fee-for-service models um, as it would apply for, uh, for paying students as well. So when you're looking at uh, those different funding, those funding streams, uh, capturing what that looks like, um, that is embedded in what would be called and what you could operationalize as a coordinated finance plan. And that would be uh, something that could serve multiple services purposes. It's a tool for uh, talking with your funders so you clearly under understand the design of your braided system. It can help programmatic staff or fiscal staff or your board uh, understand why decisions are being made uh, and it can increase everyone's confidence in the funding is being used appropriately uh, including that blending and braiding multiple funding streams will not result uh, in supplanting. And there's a number of different tools out there uh, that are provided. We have a uh, a toolkit. Oh, we'll get to that in a second. Spark um, Coffee has a, a toolkit for capturing what those funding streams look like. But also, there's other organizations like Jobs for the Future that really help walk through uh, understanding what those smaller dollar, maybe large funding strategies could be, uh, and and how those could be leveraged. Let's pause here and do a poll. So as far as your organization goes and what they're hoping to achieve through leveraging resources, uh, what would you say that your, your end goal is for uh, using a blended and braided model or a different type of model? Is it to grow the program? Is it to respond to funding cuts? Or is it to sustain the program as it is? Growing of, of the program, coming in at seven, nine, looks like that's the trend here. Uh, and so growing the program, and that would be, it would be an interesting follow-up to explore which sectors across different programmatic areas um, that your, that your uh, fellow webinar attendees are interested in growing. Is it kind of overall growth across the school institution, the district, or is it within different programmatic areas? And I'll let that stand as a 
in a rhetorical question, but it'd be interesting to know where blending and braiding could play a programmatic lift for your work that you're doing. And again, looping it back to understanding which populations are eligible for which funding stream is a net matrix, if you want to visualize it, and understanding your gaps and where eligible funding streams are is essential for answering that question and getting closer to what that coordinated financing plan would be for your overall institution or your specific program that you're looking to ramp up. Let's go to the next. I want to dig a little bit deeper and ask, what have you found to be the most challenging aspect of leveraging resources and maybe using the either blended funding streams or braided funding streams, whether that was developing a programmatic budget and cost allocation. As far as braiding going, did you establish a challenge to establishing a front door and back door protocol? Overall tracking and reporting as a challenge or barrier, developing aligned financial systems, navigating the contracting process, and then we have quality control and staff training as well. We have ones across the board. We have four for tracking and reporting. Tracking and reporting seems to emerge as the most prevalent theme along with developing aligned financial systems and navigating the contract process, quality control and staff. We have a good spread across those different challenges there and our following presenters are experts in their field and experts in implementing their successes. So perhaps they can even draw on these challenges here as some good points to touch base on moving forward. Advance the slide. Again, online available. There are templates through a few different organizations, again, including Jobs for Future and then Spark Policy Institute on operationalizing this planning process, this fiscal planning process. So at each step in the process of identifying a vision and who those partners are to defining what your core programs and services are that go to achieving that vision, to exploring different financial options and developing a coordinated financing plan all the way to implementing tracking and improving. There are templates out there that you can draw on for free to really match up which strategies will work best for you. So no need to reinvent the wheel when thinking through frameworks in which you can articulate the scope of what you're trying to achieve, identify suitable partners, think through resources, and then overcome barriers and what that looks like. And there's an additional screenshot as well of the toolkit that's available and different examples of case studies of different organizations and educational institutions walking through this model. And there's accelerating opportunity. There's another model out there that's looking to align not only just what is happening at the ground level, but at aligning state policy as well to capitalize on federal plus state policy to impact change. So there's additional resources on the accelerating opportunity website in addition to the Spark Policy Institute and their toolkit as well. And at that point, I'm going to wrap up here and thank everyone for the time. And I look forward to the next presentation. Okay, Alex, thank you very much for giving us some background information, overview information on blending versus braiding, and also for sharing some examples of what that looks like for the receiver and the user of this information, as well as providing some resources. And I want to make sure that everyone on the webinar checks out the middle, I guess the third from the top chat pod that has the handouts. And in there, you will find all of the PowerPoint presentations 
here that you'll see today available for you to download, and you can do that at any point during the presentation. And then, Alex, if you wanted to also share this last slide here, I believe, is the toolkit from Spark Policy Institute. And so I've seen a request here to get the um, website information about the accelerating opportunity information as well as your toolkit. So if you can share that information and you can type it in the chat pod or you can share it verbally. And then we do have one question from Bill Betancourt and his question for you and it might be for the other presenters to consider and respond to as well. But his question is, what do you call it when agencies collaborate and share to get the real work done, but there's really no level of accountable funding to report out? So they're jointly doing the work, but it's not done in any financial way. And, and I would say that's still leveraging resources. And as we started off with sharing, Bill, leveraging resources one way of doing that is through blending and braiding funding, but you can also leverage resources in the way in which you shared or asked about, which is doing the work together collaboratively to get it done and not necessarily having a financial link tied to it. But this is the goal here is to help you understand how you can link those financial resources to also leverage the opportunities and increase the opportunities for your student success. All right. Thanks, Bill. And um, I'm hoping I answered that, but Alex, if you want to add anything to that before we move on to our next presentation. No, I just wanted to compliment the, the trend towards cooperation rather than competition sometimes within, within a state for different resources and resource dollars. Um, the, the best practice is moving towards that interdistrict, intradistrict uh, cooperation seems to be key in success. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, I think he said that's a good way to say it. Collaboration and cooperation. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Alex. And Trudy, we will see if we can get you some more information on the accelerating opportunity. Alex, if you have any further information that you want to share with us in that, if you can share that in the presenter chat, and then I see that you typed that there, um, that will be a value for those who are on the webinar. And Trudy, I think that's what we were mentioning. So I am going to introduce our next presenter, Valentina Portel, who's going to talk us through and share her experiences and examples, real live examples of how her program, the School of Continuing Education, has worked with many partners to collaborate and cooperate to leverage resources. And so Valentina's, her first slide is up, and as you see, it's got a lot of logos there. And I will turn it over to Valentina to let her explain what that is all about. Thanks so much, Valentina, and Alex, thank you as well. Thank you, Trudy. Good afternoon, everyone. Valentina here. I'm excited to share two examples today of resource braiding under the AEBG umbrella. But before I do that, please allow me to introduce our consortium. I'm honored to represent North Orange County Regional Consortium for Adult Education or as someone recently called us for short, Knock Rock. We are a family of eight members, including five K-12 school districts, Orange County Department of Education, North Orange ROP, and North Orange County Community College District, which consists of three sister institutions, Cypress College, Fullerton College, and the non-credit entity, School of Continuing Education. Um, so on the slide here, you see uh, a quote. Actually, it's a direct quote from AB86, Rethinking and Redesigning Adult Education Together. And in our consortium, um, I have to say, we 
took, took it to heart, and we actually have been using this quote as our tagline. And as I um, introduce some of our experiences, I just wanted to remind you um, that we have a few questions for you um, under the pod chat. So please um, take your time. If you have any questions or comments or ideas, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, we have scheduled some time where um, I'll try to at least respond or comment back. All of the North Orange um, County Regional Consortium Regional Plan strategies include braiding of resources of some sort. Um, these could be financial, human, or physical. But today I would like to present two particular strategies because they were developed for, I would say, maybe less known AEBG program areas. They are innovative in nature and they are unique in the way they braid resources. So I will begin with Love and Logic strategy, which was developed in response to the regional needs assessment findings for the AEBG program area number four, which is programs for adults designed to develop knowledge and skills to assist children to succeed academically in school. Creating nurturing environment at home and at school, as well as providing socio-emotional support to children, was our number one need in the region. And after the review of several models, Love and Logic clearly stood out, uh, because we thought that this was the most universal curriculum, and it also included some elements um, of academic success. So in collaboration with Dr. Charles Fay and uh, Parenting with Love and Logic Institute, and Dr. Fay um, is the author of a famous series of books of the same name, Parenting with Love and Logic, our community college faculty developed a series of courses and workshops based on the Love and Logic model for parents and educators. Love and Logic tools are being covered in the workshop. And as this slide shows, they include preventing misbehavior and increasing instructional time on task, avoiding power struggle while setting limits, teaching character and responsibility through the application of logical consequences instead of punishment, and developing positive cooperative relationships. So the pilot year for the Love and Logic strategy included eight workshops, which were attended by 225 participants. And we have recently extended the network of our partners to three high school districts, one elementary school district, and a community church. The initial outcomes of the Love and Logic strategy are very encouraging. Besides gaining knowledge and practical skills of positive parenting and support of children's academic success, both parents and teachers who participated in the training reported building local networks and support groups. They have also reported increased confidence in both parenting and teaching. The participants' testimonies clearly demonstrated that healthy families and classroom environment lead to building resilience in children, which, as we know, is a high predictor of success, both academically and career-wise. Just a few testimonies and um, a few uh, words, kind words from our students. You can see their photos and their quotes um, on the slide in front of you. The father, who was separated from his wife just 10 months prior to class, whose photo you can see on the slide, reported that after applying Love and Logic principles, he was able to have an open and meaningful conversation with his boys. And that's for the first time. A mother uh, reported keeping Love and Logic flashcards conveniently in the glove compartment of her car and using them every time when a conversation with her teenage daughter becomes heated. I think a lot of us can relate. Love and Logic strategy would not have been possible without multiple partners. 
So how did we braid resources to make this specific strategy possible to the adult learners in our region? Well, K-12 members and partner districts, um, they include an elementary school district, as I mentioned, serve as the recipients of the services. So naturally, they contribute facilities, coordinate outreach to parents and teachers, and they also compensate their teachers for participating in the training. Community College District took the lead in the research for the curriculum. We also provided the teaching faculty and all training materials. The local community church, which recently joined our project, provides childcare for um, the classes that are being held at their site. We um, have learned that many of our K-12 members already provide very dynamic parent academies. So Love and Logic is not meant to replace these efforts, but, but to enhance them. Love and Logic courses are currently in the process of state approval, so we are hoping to braid funding and make it more efficient even further. Because once approved, these courses will be offered for community college apportionment thus freeing up AEBG funds for other strategies in the region. All right, time to um, hear your thoughts or questions. And if you, let's see, please take your time, share some thoughts on um, how you have determined regional needs in uh, your consortium. and how together you're planning on, on bridging those gaps. And also, if the principles of love and logic strategy resonated with you as practitioners, I'd love to hear your ideas on how you think love and logic uh, model or principles could enhance um, adult education services in your region. And we can definitely come back and um, take our time discussing your ideas, um, maybe even after my portion of the presentation. So I think it's OK for us to move on, at least for now. Okay. All right, so the next strategy, Arise, was developed in response to the regional need to provide support for adult learners with autism spectrum disorder who are transitioning from K-12 to further education and workforce. So in collaboration with K-12 practitioners, community college faculty developed the ARISE strategy. It's an acronym, so it stands for Academics, Relationships, Independence, Self-Advocacy, and Emotional Health. ARISE includes two components. One component is a lab, which is uniquely equipped and staffed to support students with ASD. It is a center where students can receive one-on-one -on -one and small group assistance with academics, communication skills, and interpersonal relationships, among many other things. The scheduling is flexible. It's a, a drop-in sort of model, so students can stop by and receive assistance in real time. The second component of the ARISE strategy is professional development training for K-12 and community college staff and faculty on the best and promising practices of accommodating students with autism. The ARISE lab, um, and the photo of the lab you can see on your slide, is located at the Anaheim campus of the School of Continuing Education. It is our largest center, serving about 10,000 students on any given year. Um, we have selected the center again because of its size, but we are working on replicating the elements of ARISE at other consortium sites by offering counseling support for transitional students at our K-12 sites and equipping mini ARISE labs at other SCE centers.
Similar to Law and Logic, it sure took many partners contributed, contributing to make a rise possible. Community College District used general funds to finance a full-time lead counselor position and to outfit the Arise Lab. AEBG funds were used to cover a classified instructional assistant position and part-time professional experts who will deliver selected components of Arise at other consortium sites. K-12 members refer students to the Arise Center and coordinate transition nights where the Arise strategy is introduced. So as you can see, we graded um, physical resources, human resources, funding, and uh, also various functions and activities, all leading to the success of the ARISE strategy. Recently, the ARISE students toured our sister institution, the Cypress College Culinary Art Department, where they were introduced to the jobs in the hospitality industry and, of course, treated to a delicious lunch prepared by students. It's time again to hear from our participants. I realize it's probably a lot of information all at once, so I will hear to hear your I will wait to hear your ideas and comments. Meanwhile, we'll move on to the next slide. Oh, someone is typing. All right, looks like multiple attendees are typing, so let's see. All right, so there is an interest in leveraging community college general funds with AEBG funds. Um, it's a great question. Um, under the uh, recent revision of the definition of the AEBG student, AEBG student is considered to be any student in adult education and non-credit community college education falling under seven AEBG covered program areas. So this is definitely your in uh, into uh, braiding or incorporating community college resources. Those community colleges that offer um, non-credit programs in um, the instructional areas that align with adult education block grants, specifically ESL, citizenship, adults with disability, CTE, um, should be able or should be encouraged, of course, to uh, put the non-credit apportionment dollars on the table as a resource to leverage resources uh, for the consortium. If community colleges happen not to have non-credit programs or have very limited uh, or small non-credit programs, then a way to tap into other resources would be to inquire about um, student Success and Support Program, Strong Workforce Program, and Student Equity Program, as well as Basic Skills Initiative. All these categorical or grant programs um, serve similar needs um, and function in, in similar ways as AEBG funds. So there's definitely an opportunity for grading. Let's see. Well, thank you for your comment, Laura. Yes, ARISE includes self-advocacy and emotional health. And like I said, the health is real time. Sometimes our students experience difficult days when it comes to uh, communicating with others or uh, maintaining uh, relationships. So they can actually come in and meet with an advisor, a counselor, or a peer mentor and um, maybe get some tips. Okay. Successful resource braiding. As we all know, it takes a village, or in AEBG terms, a region, to plan and implement comprehensive adult education. And I would even say that resource braiding is not the goal in itself, but rather a natural outcome of a successful partnership. And this is how it works at North Orange County Regional Consortium. 
we get together to identify regional gaps and define mutual goals. In fact, the more partners are involved in this step, the better, because it ensures an in-depth regional evaluation of needs and hopefully a buy-in from a, a broad range of partners within the region, which in itself could lead to um, future outreach uh, for potential participants in the strategies and also in the availability of, ad of additional resources. I'm just going back to one of the participants' questions, uh, sometimes just hearing about opportunities within the region, agencies would volunteer their resources. Um, maybe they just were not aware of the programs that would have a potential for braiding. In fact, the photo on this slide was taken at our consortium's regional annual partners breakfast, which in a matter of three years actually grew from um, about 50 to 150 participants, representing at least 40 different organizations within our region. And uh, once the goals have been identified, the steps and the resources to reach these goals should be determined. Uh, the types of the resources contributed by various partners, of course, will vary. Um, it may be a space for a class or transportation, an internship site, um, hospitality, but of course everything helps. All are welcome to contribute. Um, but ultimately, um, all these resources and all the partners' contributions should lead to one goal, which is the success of the selected adult education strategy when we are talking about AEBG fund braiding. And finally, um, an effective way of um, evaluating whether we are reaching our goal of serving more students and in a more comprehensive manner uh, would be to develop effectiveness metrics that would be specific to the strategies that were selected uh, for the uh, regional plan and uh, an effective way to breaking down silos and barriers is to always think students first. Well, this concludes my portion of the webinar. Thank you very much for your time and especially for your insights. I'd love to hear more of your comments or questions, um, so please use my contact information on this screen to reach me. Thank you again. Thank you, Valentina. It was great to hear those examples from your program, two models that have worked successfully to leverage resources. Um, I do encourage the participants to reach out to Valentina so that you can learn more about how those programs work. I'm going to now introduce Steve Curiel, who is the principal at Huntington Beach Adult School, and he's also going to share his experiences with leveraging resources and some examples in his K-12 adult school environment. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say uh, thanks for joining us. I think this topic is timely, and um, I was uh, honored to be able to share some of my thoughts and some of the things that we do here at the adult school in Huntington Beach, where even here it's extremely hot, and I'm glad I'm inside in an office uh, presenting. So um, moving along, let's see here. So. When you think of leveraging, ultimately you're thinking about uh, students and uh, outcomes, as Valentina and Alex were, were explaining earlier. Um, I'm, I take it at a very simple, I start with a very simple perspective. What should it look like for students? Uh, what's their experience uh, when we're talking about leveraging? Um, so they should ultimately see increased services and support. Um, uh, that could be child care services, could be uh, uh, new locations of classes that are closer to where they live, uh, transportation support, uh, a variety of things. I mean, it's really uh, up to you and your imagination and, and wherever you can get to partner with to provide the students the services that they need. Ultimately, keeping in mind that it's the student that should drive what services you're delivering. They shouldn't 
uh, know that there's these leveraging of source uh, resources. They don't really care. They're just looking for the resources and, and the support to get through whatever program to reach whatever goal they have. Um, so it should be for them a transparent process. They just know they're getting uh, child care, for example, and it doesn't matter where it comes from. Uh, all that is happening, uh, as Alex had explained, at the front door in the registration intake, you're determining the eligibility uh, just by getting some information from them. Uh, we try to avoid having them fill out multiple forms with the same information. We want to get, we just want to ask them for their name and the, their phone number, or birthday, just one time, and from there we do all the back end uh, to figure out what benefits they qualify for. Uh, and it should mean better success for your students. Uh, you know, outcome driven, they should feel that they're progressing. Um, your staff should see that there are more students being successful, um, and obviously less dropping out, a, you know, an inverse look at that, uh, uh, tracking how many students uh, have dropped out in the past and with these new, new services, child care, uh, transportation, close locations, you should also see a drop uh, in the number of students that, aren't cut, that are uh, dropping out of your program. So uh, for the very, very simple uh, look for, uh, perspective from the students, uh, then it, what about for the, uh, what should it look like for your partners, that including yourself. So as, as referenced before, uh, no silos. You start kind of looking at each other's programs, understanding each other's programs. Uh, the idea of leveraging is it's, it's a win-win for all partners. Um, it should make things easier for partners. Uh, otherwise, why would you leverage? Uh, why would you work together? Uh, you, should, you should start seeing an eagerness to work together. And some of the examples that were uh, explained earlier or given earlier and some of the questions you asked, you know, how do you approach partners? Was well, that initial uh, conversation? Uh, it, it's seeing opportunities where obviously you're going to benefit, your students are going to benefit. The partners that are engaging are going to see potential benefits and opportunities for their uh, their outcomes for the, the goals that they have in mind. And so um, there should be this eagerness once you start uh, talking to each other, once you start having those conversations um, about uh, what, you, what it is you do and, and how you're driven. Um, and there should be improved outcomes for all partners. Uh, that is either you have more student enrollment, you have a higher success rate, partners are seeing uh, more students serve. Uh, maybe there where you're decreasing the poverty in a certain area uh, by getting students jobs, uh, or you're seeing increased literacy levels, which is a, a common goal for an adult school program and maybe some other partners. So ultimately, everyone is seeing an improvement in outcomes that are important to them. And I can't stress that enough. That's, that's just really understanding um, what your partners are in it for um, and looking for those commonalities, those common goals. Uh, what does it look like at HBAS here in our program? So we have a number of partners that we uh, have had over over the years, even before uh, AEBG, um, and I think most of you have some sorts, some some community partners as well. Uh, we here at Huntington Beach Adult School, we leverage our WIOA funds, uh, Title II funds. We also work with our one stops that use Title I funding to help. Uh, pay for some of the cost of our CTE programs for our students slash their clients. Uh, we receive CalWORKs funding. Uh, we obviously receive our ABG dollars. Um, we also partner with our community colleges who are, are using both a combination ABG dollars and other, other sources of funds to help uh, build transitions and pipelines from our program into their program. And we've had a number of, of uh, community-based organizations that work with us, churches, um, Boys and Girls Club, um, Dress for Success. There's a lot of community partners that have been working with us uh, over the years and continue to work with us. Um, there's a short list of them. Um, uh, for our staff, uh, the resources that aren't only benefiting our uh, students, but they've also, some of our staff qualify for 
professional development opportunities, maybe from a partner who's got um, an area of expertise. For example, if they do training in um, uh, computers, uh, Excel, for example, and, and uh, some of our community colleges uh, um, have offered our, our staff to attend some of their advanced Excel programs or Cisco training. Uh, Cisco is a new program for us, so we partnered in that way. Uh, and then also with WIOA funding, WIOA Title II funding, we use that to help our and professional develop our staff to make sure they're giving the best instruction. Uh, facilities, we have a number of uh, partners that give us uh, facilities, uh, free rent uh, for the most part. They do ask, some of them do ask for some utilities costs, but uh, definitely we're able to spread out and offer classes that are closer to students. Uh, where they live and where they reside, where they do most of their uh, community work and, and schooling uh, with their kids. Um, uh, these partners have been uh, fundamental in, in helping us meet the demand of our students because in all honesty, our, our, our district by itself and the facilities we have have not been, uh, we haven't been able to serve the needs. So our other partners as in churches, community, um, sorry, churches, elementary school districts have provided us a ton of facilities provide classes. Uh, student impact for our students, uh, we're able to provide what we call financial aid or financial assistance. They, that's the term we use. We actually use CalWORKs funding um, and, uh, or just do fee waivers uh, our own, with our own budgeting. We, we allocate a certain amount of funds that we will just uh, call or consider financial assistance. Uh, we're able to provide more support material for our students, whether it's um, uh, one example, we, we've uh, purchased planners uh, that help students uh, schedule out their week uh, and make sure they're, they've got their classes scheduled and their homework scheduled. And, and so uh, that's been very successful. Uh, we do buy a lot of technology. Uh, we want to make sure our students are learning uh, the skills they need to not only get it, not only uh, apply for a job, because as you know, most many jobs are now responding online. Um, online applications, uh, but then also as well being able to keep a job if it does require those technical skills. Uh, we provide child care um, at a number of locations. Uh, and I think the biggest thing that, I, that, I, that we leverage our, our partners with is uh, uh, classes that are closer to where the students live. Um, as you know, many of our students, uh, if, it's, if it involves more than so many miles away from their home, uh, that becomes a barrier, and so we do make sure we try to be as close to our students as possible. One of our examples that uh, I inherited, I'm not going to take credit for building this program. This was here when I came to Huntington Beach, and it's called the Twilight Program. And if you can imagine uh, school buses, I think there's about 14 of them that travel around the uh, Huntington Beach Union High School District. Uh, which includes Westminster, Huntington Beach, Mount Valley, uh, travels around that whole area, those whole cities, and, and certain areas where the typically you'll find high density apartments, um, you'll find a high uh, English learner population. They come in with the buses and pick up families. Uh, and it has to be a family, it has to be a parent with a K-12 student or a um, toddler even. It's just they've got to have a child with them. Uh, and the buses um, all meet at Golden West College. They congregate there right around 6.30 in the evening. And uh, parents and kids are coming off. Uh, and they're just kids go one direction and head out for tutoring. Um, and then they get some snacks with that. Um, and then the parents head out to the other classrooms there at Golden West. And they receive ES, received ESL instruction as well as um, uh, parent education uh, for their kids. So uh, really an awesome program. Uh, it's three nights a week. And uh, it's, been, it's been done for, we've been doing it for about 10 years now. So uh, how does that work? Um, what, are the, what are we leveraging? Uh, so the partners that we have involved are ourselves, Boys and Girls Club, uh, our local elementary school districts, which there are three, I think all four currently signed on to the MOU to provide some kind of support. Um, and then we have Golden West College. Um, and so uh, we're providing the ESL instruction and uh, 
from uh, from this partnership. We're benefiting. We're, that's probably our highest performing program in terms of uh, learning games from students. Uh, you can probably understand why, because it's probably the most supportive atmosphere or environment for not only the, the our students but also for the kids. And it's just uh, uh, an amazing uh, success story uh, there. Uh, Boys and Girls Club. They're the they're pretty much almost the backbone of this. Uh, they're the ones that provide the buses. Um, they provide the tutors for the tutoring of the K-12 kids. They provide child care uh, for those uh, children that are not uh, school aged. And then they also are able to provide snacks uh, and school supplies. They purchased back. They bought backpacks through certain uh, um, donations they received. They do obviously a lot of of uh, leveraging of other sources, uh, fund sources themselves. They're constantly looking for grants, and uh, then they, they feed those uh, grants and uh, resources back into the Twilight program. And they're looking for just more outcomes. How many students are they serving? How many kids are being served? What are they, uh, are they, what kind of grades are they getting? All that is data they use to generate more funds uh, to help support the program. And, and actually apply for other uh, other programs that they offer within their area of service. Our local elementary districts uh, provide the parent education. They, they each have a someone whose uh, responsibility is to provide that. And it, they just saw a perfect opportunity to come in and uh, get a large group of parents, along with kids, when they want the kids involved, and provide uh, education. And typically, and what they've said, it's a, very, it's a difficult group to reach. Um, our, uh, the, our parents of the Yale populations, uh, but the fact that they're all there, they've been bused to one location, uh, it makes it very easy for them to reach out to them. They also provide nurses to do health screenings for some of the kids, uh, especially the kids that are just entering, so they can kind of have an idea where, where kids are before they enter their uh, whichever K-12 uh, or K-8 uh, school district they're going into. And Golden West College provides the classrooms, and that's, uh, that's even at a time when Space is limited. They're going through a lot of modernization and building new buildings, and so it's a constant shift of classrooms. But they've always managed to find a place for ESL students, typically about three classrooms, and then about four classrooms for tutoring um, uh, for the uh, uh, school-age kid children. And so they've been very supportive that way. And there really is an awesome way for them to promote their college in the area. Um, for students who are coming in from all the different cities, which where they have other options for colleges um, as well. But um, Golden West has been supportive in that way. A question for us. So after hearing some of these services, what are some services that you would like to provide your students? And who's out there in the community who delivers those services that you might not have thought of or are thinking of uh, reaching out to and trying to find those common goals, um, common focus areas, so that both people, both partners, or multiple partners can benefit. So I'll wait a few minutes. I'm really stealing ideas here. No, no shame in that game. Uh, I'd I love to hear from others to see what they're thinking and, and who's out there that they're partnering with. Correct, yes. There was a question about um, how many nights. That's three nights a week, um, Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, and the cost, uh, I wish I, I knew I should have looked at the cost, but um, I know summer um, we have to reduce down to two nights if we're even able to offer it. We weren't able to offer it this last uh, summer, but typically we will, we will uh, run the program through summer, which for us is mid-June through July, end of July. Um, just to keep that, um, keep it going. As you know, a big break is uh, is tough to recover from. Some, to recover from, uh, from some of the for some of the families who uh, who break the routine and then they're not uh, they forget about us quickly. So um, and uh, yeah, Diana, yeah, we're, I'm happy it's still going on. That's been a core of our ESL program um, for many years. So that's a a, a cherished program. So we got, uh, let's see here, uh, Suzanne, considering housing agency here on campus that supports not only students but the community as well. Well, that is awesome. That is another area where 
that we keep hearing about, and, and I would love to hear how that goes. That's a, a barrier for many of our students' challenges that they have. Um, so that would be great if you could reach out to them. And Tarek is, uh, child care is always challenged. What organizations are other consortia partnering with to provide child care? Uh, Catholic Charities. Um, uh, Boys and Girls Club, they, they are somewhat, I would say, experts in that area. There's a lot of Boys and Girls Clubs in this, in these, in this area. Um, they have the ability to serve, it's just they need to find the funds to offer uh, child care, especially in the evening. I would imagine their staff becomes available in the evening, but they've got the infrastructure, they know all the licensing requirements. So Boys and Girls Club, uh, Catholic Charities, um, um, YMCA, uh, we don't have a YMCA that I know of serves this area, but Boys and Girls Club is dominant. So other areas, and I've talked to other administrators, they have YMCAs that they, they were looking at approaching. Especially now, if there's ABG funds that are available, or uh, and uh, for us, we've had funds to offer childcare. It's just sometimes hard to get to childcare providers. Boys and Girls Club is limited to to staying within the Huntington Beach City footprint boundary. So out in Westminster, we partner with the elementary school districts, and they provide the childcare, um, and we split the cost for that. And so um, that's been very helpful. Um, and there was a time when there were CBED funds that they had access to. Uh, those have been swept, but some of the districts have still continued to do that. Okay. Uh, the city owes by support services like food banks. Yes, uh, food banks, um, uh, connecting with them. They, we have reached out to them, and, and uh, it's just, uh, well, let me go with the questions back to the PowerPoint, but food banks, those other other areas that we've been curious about, so let me know how that goes. So some of the challenges that we do, we are facing or are constantly having to work, deal with is building and maintaining that relationship. And it really does come back to that relationship be it between partners, among partners, um, so that they're willingly coming to the table, willingly sharing their resource, talking about what it is they can support, uh, support your students with. Um, that just takes time. And it takes time to build trust. Um, there is, uh, I always, whenever you're talking about money, there's always a suspicion that comes with that. And so um, you have to build a trust and put the time into it. I know we're all busy, uh, but many of those meetings, community meetings, chamber of commerce meetings, uh, in many ways have to be near the top of the list because that's how you're going to be able to make the connection to, to find out what opportunities are out there and then build that uh, leveraging. Uh, that we're, we're identifying that we need. Um, and tracking and reporting leverage funds accurately, that could be challenging. As Alex had explained earlier, if you don't have a, a financial system that can do that well, um, uh, that, that would be um, an area you might want to focus and talk to your district and see if it's possible to get a better system. Uh, dispelling myths about what you can and can't do with each other's funds. Sometimes, and this is where it gets a little tricky, I, I've had to research fund sources that I don't have access to that other partners do. And after that relationship is built, after the trust is built, see if we can look at other ways of where the funds can be used. Because sometimes you just inherit something and you operate it and use the funds the way you, that they've always been using it. And uh, if you can point out to them that there is a way for them to help you out that they haven't thought of before, then um, that's something that uh, can be challenging and not uh, interrupting the trust there. Okay, so we got, we're going to move, we're going to skip because I think we're out of time, uh, the last question. But here are some tips. Uh, uh, not an option. Leveraging is not an option. Uh, that's ex it's expected from us, especially in AEBG. Uh, like I said, it's timely that this PowerPoint or this presentation is being held, held as we are all, or many of us are submitting our AEBG or working our AEBG. And there's questions about leveraging, how we're leveraging funds. Uh, it starts with a conversation. Just you got to talk about what you, what it is you guys consider is important. Um, listen to what it is that the, your partner, who you're wanting to partner with, what they consider important, what they need in terms of outcomes, and look for ways you can deliver that. And recognize it takes time. Take baby steps. You don't have to build a program right away. It's just getting that relationship going. Start with something small. 
and then build on that. So here are some other areas. If you're looking for partners, workforce boards, uh, wheel plans, regional plans, you can see a lot of uh, different people uh, involved in these already. Uh, ABG fact sheet has your fund sources already laid out so you understand, well, at least in terms of funding, what other partners are getting. Um, strong workforce plans have a lot of built-in collaborative collaboration there with various partners. And so if you're not involved in those, then those are areas you might want to look at. And that's my contact info, and I will give it back to Sharice so we can finish on time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Steve. I know this is a very exciting workshop or, or webinar when you get to share some of the examples from your own programs. And so I really appreciate what you shared, Steve and Valentina as well. They were real examples showing how leveraging resources can work and support the, the overview that Alex shared with us early on. It is the end of our webinar today and we are at 2.30 exactly and so I want to let you know that we have a evaluation that you will be receiving as soon as the webinar is done and then we have a couple of chat pods up here that we want you to to help us with especially the one that's in the center of your screen that says what from today's session might you consider applying and then also to share with us any questions and comments that you have, but especially in that comments chat to let us know what other topics and areas of interest that you have as well for future professional development webinar and training opportunities. We want to remind you that you can find all of the professional development opportunities at the AEBG.org website. And we do want to thank you because this was an hour and a half of your time this afternoon and we know how valuable your time is and for the most part all of you started with us right at one o'clock and you're continuing with us now until 2.30 so we really do appreciate that and if you have any questions comments or thoughts to share in the chat pod please do we will stay here for another few minutes you can download the presentations here on the bottom where it says handout those are available for you to download. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your afternoon and a great rest of your week. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Valentina. And, Sudi, thank you as well. Bye.